to come. He'd be persecuted, beaten and mocked. The Son of Man would die on a cross, but he wouldn't stay dead. He won't stay gone. He didn't stay dead. He won't stay gone. Jesus is coming to take us home. By his blood he has bought me. surely shall come like a thief in the night with trump of God the king of kings who paid the cost he wouldn't stay dead and he won't stay dead he didn't stay dead and he won't stay gone Jesus is coming But he has bought me, and his word he has taught me. He didn't stay dead, and he won't stay gone. He didn't stay dead, and he won't stay gone. Jesus is coming to take us home. By his blood he has bought me, and his word he has taught me. He didn't say dead, and he won't say gone. Yeah. 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 The dreams of my childhood have all fallen through. I guess I built my castles in the sand, but Jesus has come true because on Christ the solid rock I stand and I've never been disappointed in Jesus doubt has never crossed my mind for in him discouraged with my family forsaken by my friends but I've never been disappointed in it I've been given many things I've had them taken away of God is still mine today. Men will give their words, but they don't follow through. But I found every promise in His Word is really true. And I've never been Disappointed in Jesus Doubt has never crossed my mind For in Him no fault I find I've been discouraged with my family Forsaken by my friends But I've never been Disappointed in me. Second Chronicles chapter thirty-three. Second Chronicles chapter thirty-three tonight. We'll say it is an honor and a privilege to get to stand behind a pulpit again. Amen. Always counted an honor and a privilege. 
found your place in 2 Chronicles chapter 33. I'd like to ask you to stand in reverence of God's Word. <clears throat> Do a little more reading than normal, but I want to get the whole picture of what's going on here in the text. We're going to read about 10 verses here, 2 Chronicles 33. Bring you what the Lord's laid on our heart. Begin reading in verse number 10, 2 Chronicles chapter 33 and verse number 10. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the, thorn, among the thorns, and bound him with fetters, and carried him to Babylon. And when he was in affliction, he besought the, besought the Lord his God, and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers, and prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him. And he heard his supplication, and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. Amen. Now after this he built a wall without, without the city of David on the west side of uh, Gihon in the valley even to the entering in at the fish gate and compassed about Ophel and raised it up a very great height and put captains of war in all the, fences, in all the fenced cities of Judea or Judah. And he took away the strange gods and the idols out of the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem and cast them out of the city. And he repaired the altar of the Lord and sacrificed their own peace offerings and thank, and thank offerings uh, and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. Nevertheless, the people did sacrifice still in the high places, yet unto the Lord their God only. Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and his prayer unto his God, and the words of the seer, seers that spake to him, in the name of the Lord God of Israel, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel. His prayer also, and how God was entreated of him, and all his sin and his trespass, and the places wherein he built high places, and set up groves and graven images before he was humbled, behold, they are written among the sayings of the seers. So Manasseh slept with his father, and they buried him in his own house, and Amon, his son, reigned in his stead. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you again, Lord, for the blessings of another day. Lord, I want to thank you for health and strength, Lord, that you blessed us with. Lord, now that it's preaching time, God, I need a touch tonight. God, I need you more than anything in this world tonight. God, I need you more than anything, God. Lord, that this world's got to offer me. God, I, I need you more. God, I need a touch. I need an anointing. God, I need a feeling, God, from this, from this, uh, uh, from on high tonight. God, I need you, God. Lord, I pray that you'd fill my lips with, Lord, the words to say. God, I pray that you'd give me clarity of thought. God, I pray that you'd help me to be in the right manner and the right attitude to preach. God, I pray that you'd help me and fill me with your sweet spirit tonight. And God, I pray that you'd just help us. Help us to receive the word of God with open hearts and to see what you want us to see. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You can be seated. Second Chronicles chapter number 33 is a very, uh, I guess, unusual portion of Scripture. Uh, one that's not really ever preached out of. One that's not ever really read out of. Uh, a lot of people in the building may not have ever heard this story. Even read, may not have even read it for yourself. But to give you a little background of what's going on here in Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles was a book... Uh, it was a given of a history. It was more or less written of history in the, in the priest's viewpoint. We can look through 1 Kings and 2 Kings and 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles and it's a little repetitive on and on through those four books. And 1 and 2 Kings is history by uh, the prophet's point of view and 1 and 2 Chronicles is history by the priest's point of view. 1 and 2 Kings is the human, stand, uh, the human standpoint. 1 and 2 Chronicles is the divine standpoint. 1 and 2 Kings is the man's ruling. But 1 and 2 Chronicles is God's overruling. M much can be said about uh, the difference in the repetitive of these two books or these two uh, books that have been written much can be said but one of the greatest examples I believe that we can see is the difference of the portion of Scripture in, in 2 Kings chapter number 18 and verse number 4 through 6 we see the revival under King Hezekiah the revival under King Hezekiah here, it was given two separate times. It was given in 2 Kings chapter 18 verses 4 through 6 and it was given in 2 Chronicles chapter 29 through chapter 31. In 2, in 2 Kings it was only given in three verses. But in 2 Chronicles it was given in three chapters. That gives a little bit of a difference of what's going on. A lot of scholars say that 2 Chronicles could be one of the last books of the Old Testament. A lot of scholars will say that and they will say that the end verse of uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 36 it says who is there that's the last verse of 2 Chronicles chapter 36 verse 23 it says who is there 
In Matthew chapter number 2 and verse number 2 it says, it says, where is he? Where is he, king of the Jews? We see here that... And Chronicles was written after, uh, after the Babylonian captivity leading to the answer of where is he? Yeah. Leading where is he? Yeah. Where is he, king of the yeah. Jews? The Bible, the Bible says here in 2 Chronicles 36, 23, it says, who is there? Yeah. But Matthew 2 and 2 says, where is he? Yeah. The Bible, we know, we know who Matthew 2 and 2 is talking about. Ah, where is he, king of the Jews? But in our text, that's just a little rabbit we're going to chase to lead you up to where we're going tonight. In our text tonight, well, we find a man named Manasseh. Yeah. A lot of people may not know who Manasseh is. Manasseh was a man of, uh, in history, we can read through history, of the kings of all Judah of all Judea, and we can hear and read about Manasseh. He was one of the most wicked, most vile kings of, of, king, he was of the kings of Judea. He was one of the most wicked and vile kings. But one thing that stuck out to me, Brother Scott, is that he reigned longer than any other king of all Judah. He reigned for 55 years. He began his reign as a 12-year-old boy, and he reigned when he was 67 years old. And when he died, he died as a 50, 50 years of reign over all of Judea. Fifty-five years of one of the most wicked and most vile kings of all known history of Judah. But we see here in 2 Chronicles 33 and 3, you may say, Preacher, why was Manasseh so wicked and so vile? 2 Chronicles 33 and verse number 3 in the early portions of, of this chapter, it says, For he built again the high places which Hezekiah his father had broken down. If you go over to 2 Kings chapter number 18 in those verses we were talking about, verses 4, 5, and 6, I preached out of that text a few times when it starts with one, talking about revival. You see, Hezekiah here, he had broke down all the things that the wicked kings that had, they had built up. They had built up many idols and graven images and a lot of things uh, was put into the temple and the house of God and a lot of things that didn't need to be there. And Hezekiah knew they didn't need to be there. So we know what he did. He broke them down and he got them out of the house of God and knew that it was an abomination to the Lord. But in 2 Chronicles 33, 3, we see that Manasseh, which is Hezekiah's son, he built those graven images back. He built those idols back that his father had broken down. But I believe here in 2 Chronicles 33, in the text that we read leading into the end years of Manasseh's life, he realized, he realized something, Brother Scott. He realized that in the end years of his life that God wanted to be his God, knowing that he needed what his father had had, Brother Steve. Manasseh here, he was, he was in a mess, Brother Scott. He was one of the most wicked, most vile men of, of all the kings of Judah, all, the, all of the nation. He was one of the most wicked and vile men, yep. serving gods and idols and graven images. Yep. But I want to pull out three things out of three verses. I want you to pay attention real close tonight. Verse number 10, verse number 16, and verse number 17. And I want to preach on this thought, on suffocating prides, shattered altars, and stiff knees. Suffocating prides, shattered altars, and stiff knees. You may say, preacher, that, that sounds a little hard. Well, that's what the Lord laid on my heart, so I'm going to preach it. First, I want to see out of verse number 10, suffocating prides. Verse number 10 says, And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. Amen. They would not hearken. You know what pride is, Brother Allen? Pride is consciousness of one's own dignity. Yep. Yep. That's what pride is. Manasseh and his people yep. had rebelled so much and hated God so much to the point that their pride was suffocating them. To suffocate is to the lack of the ability to breathe. They were suffocating under their own pride. Yep. Psalm 10 and 4 says, The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. A man's face is the index of his soul. You're right. You may say, preacher, what does that mean? Uh, the face that of uh, the face that you give off to people is what people think you are. Yeah. If you have the uplooking face of I'm better than you, I'm I have this and I have that, I have this and that and the other, and you don't, you know what they're gonna think about you, Brother Dole? They're gonna think that you got that suffocating pride. Yeah. Oh yeah. The Bible says in Psalm 10 and 4, it says that the wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. Amen. See, the, the prideful man, he has too much pride. He has, he has too much pride within himself to seek after God. Proverbs 16, 5 says, Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand joined in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Amen. That's what Solomon said in Proverbs 16, 5. He said, Everyone that is proud in heart 
is an abomination to the Lord. That pride is what gets us a lot of times. I like what James said in James 4 and 6. He said, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. You may say, Preacher, what is grace? Grace is unmerited favor. You may say, Preacher, I don't really understand that. Well, I'll give it to you in simple terms. It's getting something we don't deserve. Grace is unmerited favor, Brother Allen, but it is also something that we do not deserve. We did not earn God's favor. We did not merit God's favor. It is something that we did not deserve. But thanks be unto God that He gave us grace the day we got saved. And thank God that, thank God tonight that grace is what keeps us. Grace is the driving force of salvation, sanctification, and security that God offers to the ruined race of Adam. You may, you may say, preacher, what, when in that first portion of that verse, it said, God resisted the proud. I want to show you a few people in the Word of God that God resisted because they were proud. First of all, God resisted Cain because of his pride. His pride in his own religion. Cain, in history, Cain had invented one of the world's first religions. It was a vile and wicked religion. God resisted Cain. God resisted Nimrod and the builders of the Tower of Babel. You know what they were doing? They were doing something real carnal. They were trying to build their way back to God. Yep. They were trying to build that Tower of Babel as high as they could to reach up yep. to the heavens. They were trying to build that Tower of Babel up as high as they could. They were trying to merit God's favor. They were trying to do all these things with independence without God in their life. They were trying to do it in their own way, in their own time. They were trying to build that Tower of Babel as high as they could to build it to get back to God. Yep. God resisted them because they had that pride in their independence. He resisted Pharaoh in his, in his proud words against Moses in Exodus chapter 5. He said, who is the Lord? My, my, my. When you come to the state where Pharaoh had come to in his life of who is the Lord, you've come to a bad place in your life. When you don't even know who the Lord God of Israel is, when you don't know who the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is, you're in a bad place, friend. You're in a bad place. But he also resisted several kings throughout the Word of God. Just to name a few, Naaman, Nebuchadnezzar, Haman, Herod, Balaam, Belshazzar. He, he, he had resisted all of these because of pride. Right. Because of pride. God's grace does not end at salvation. God's grace does not end at salvation. It provides all that we need for the journey home. It provides all that we need, Brother Scott, for the journey home. Grace set, grace, grace set Egypt's captives free. And here's a few things that I want to pull out to you. Did they need water? It flowed from a riven rock. Did they need food? It was bread from heaven. Did they have foes? They got victory. Did they know the way? He went before them. Did they have protection? They had a canopy over them. Did they need to cross over a river? He parted the river. Did they, did they face great walls in their life? He cracked the walls and knocked them down by the grace of God. And by the grace of God they went through the wilderness those days out of the captivity of Egypt's bondage. And thank God the grace it didn't stop at salvation but it went with us every step of the way. Let me tell you friend it was grace. It was grace. It was grace. It was grace. There's a song. There's a song I've been wanting to sing for a long time. God never gave me liberty to sing it. I ain't going to sing it tonight because he ain't giving me liberty to sing it. But some friends that I went to high school with, they sing a song titled, God's Grace is Still Amazing Me. Yeah. 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 <laughs> God's yeah. amazing grace is still amazing me. Yeah. You know, we got the song Amazing Grace, and that's great. I'm going to read a little bit of it here in a second. We're going to have a good time in the Lord talking about grace for a few minutes. But God's grace is still amazing me, Brother Allen. Every morning I wake up, His grace is still there. Every morning I wake up, I see God's grace in a new light. Every morning I wake up, God's grace ain't left me yet. I was, I was on the way home the other day, Brother Allen. I was talking to the Lord on my way home, turned the radio off, wasn't talking to nobody on the phone, Brother Allen. I was talking to the Lord. You know what, Brother Allen? I was talking to him. I said, Lord, I don't know why you ain't left me yet. I don't know why you ain't left me high and dry and left me all by myself. And that sweet, small voice came to me. And he told me, you know why I ain't left you? Because I love you. And I, sp I spent all that I had just for you. Hey, hey. <laughs> yeah. 
I want to read you a few lines out of this song. God's grace is still amazing me. First verse says, Unmerited favor from the Savior is the reason I'm here today. Free pardon for a sin debt I could not erase. Unconditional love from God above when He sent down His Son to die. Unexplainable, attainable, since He took my place. Grace so amazing, grace that's still saving. Without it, I know where I'd be. Oh, it sure is something, everything for nothing. Supernal, eternal, God's grace is still amazing me. The second verse says, I was hurting. I was searching. That night I fell on my knees broken. I was ashamed. Then he whispered to me, child, your sins are gone. And now my own. Because of that old rugged cross. Undeniable. Justifiable. Oh, how can this be? God's grace is still amazing me. God's grace is still amazing me tonight. I don't know where you've gone. I don't know where you've been, but God's grace has always been there. Right on time when you needed it the most. Let me tell you something, friend. We're not going to have grace with pride in our life. It was grace. Let's read, let's read a few lines out of this wonderful song. Number 57 in our church hymnal says this. Second verse said, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed." That third verse says, "'Through many dangers, tools and snares, I have already come. Twas grace that brought me safe this far, and grace that will lead me on. It's by God's grace that we're standing here today. It's God's grace that I'll wake up in the morning. It's God's God's grace, friend. It's God's grace. It's God's amazing grace, friend, that we're standing here today. I didn't do anything to merit God's favor, Brother Dole. I didn't do anything for God to ever love me. I didn't do ever anything, Brother Allen. But you know one thing's for sure? That He loves me. But what, what James was trying to get across in James chapter 4 and verse number 6, he said, Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Yep. Yep. Brother Allen, somebody can't get saved with pride in their heart. You're right. You've come too late to tell me somebody can get saved and get right with God when they still got pride in their heart. You're right. anyway. That's what James was trying to say. He says that God resisteth the proud. You know that person that comes down to the altar that still got pride built up in their heart and don't really want to get right with God. They just want to put on a show for everybody in the church, Brother Allen. Those are the people that God resisteth. God resisteth. You know what that means, Brother Scott? Push away. That just simply means if, God, if Brother Scott tried to pull me towards him and I resisted, I'm trying to get away from him. I'm trying to get away from him. That's what the Lord's trying to do to those people with pride. The Bible says that He resisteth the proud. Our pride suffocates us. Yes, sir. You know I'm telling the truth. Our pride's what suffocates us in our churches today, Brother Allen. We got too much pride stuck up in our hearts. We're scared to do anything for God because we're scared of what somebody might think about us, scared of losing our own dignity. We need to chunk our egos every once in a while and look like a fool for Jesus. We need to chunk everything that the world thinks about us and what everybody in our families may think about us. Friend, we need to chunk all that all that junk and we just need to get right with God. Good but it's that suffocating pride. It's grace, friend. Yep. It's grace. It's grace. But not only that, a shattered altar. Yes, sir. <coughs> a shattered altar. You may say, preacher, what are you talking about? See, in the Old Testament, Brother Allen, the altar was a place of sacrifice. In the Old Testament, Brother Steve, the altar was a place of sacrifice. Yes, you bring the lambs and you bring the goats and you bring the burnt offerings to God. That, that's what the altar, that was the symbol of the altar in the Old Testament. But I, I still believe that the altar is a place of sacrifice. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. When you come to the end of yourself, yep. and you come to everything that you don't know what to do, and you just sacrifice everything that you've got to God, Amen. this right here is a place of sacrifice. Amen. 
We have too many shattered altars, Brother Steve. Brother Steve, a lot of times in our churches today, we might as well get these pews and chunk them out the front door because they don't even get used. That's what I mean by a shattered altar. These altars are practically useless to us anymore because we're too prideful to come down here. We're too prideful to come down here. We're, oh, somebody, they'll know something's wrong with me. They'll, they'll think bad of me. They'll just talk about me. They'll do this and do that. What happened to getting right with God in an old-fashioned altar? What happened coming down to an altar with a broken heart and asking God to help me and asking God to forgive me? We need an altar with a purpose, friend. We need an altar with a purpose. In the early portions of chapter number 33, you see the Bible talks about in the early portions of chapter 33 that they had altars. Manasseh had built altars. But the Bible says that he built altars to all the hosts of heaven. That's what the Bible says. He built an altar to all the hosts of heaven. You see, Brother Allen, they had altars, but they had no purpose. Those altars were just in the house of God. They had no purpose. They had no purpose whatsoever. Much like the philosophers in Acts chapter 17. Any of y'all know that story? In Acts chapter number 17, verse number 23, the apostle Paul's walking about them philosophers. They were saying, what will this babbler say next? They're talking about Paul. He said, what will that babbler say next? Paul said that he came to the altar. This is what he said. He said, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. They was praying, but they didn't know who they were praying to. They had an altar with an inscription, Brother Allen, that said, to the unknown God. They had an altar for this God. They had an altar for that God. They had God. They had an altar for this God, that they, just in case they might have missed one down the, down the line somewhere. There you go. They wanted to make sure they crossed all their T's and taught it all their eyes, and I messed that up, but that'll be all right. They wanted to make sure that they had an altar for every God in the book. Come on. Just so they could pray to every single one of them and hope to hear from heaven from one of them. Yes, sir. They had the altar to an unknown God. But I come to tell you tonight that we need an altar with a purpose. People here in 2 Chronicles 33 and Acts chapter number 17 and verse number 23, they had an altar with no purpose. Come on. They had an altar with no purpose. I want to pull out a few things real quick. Brother Allen, we need an altar with a purpose to bring our troubles to. Oh, yeah. The psalmist said in Psalm 61 2, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Brother Wayne read that verse this morning. I I had me a spell, Brother Wayne, when you read that this morning. That's one of my favorite verses the psalmist ever penned down. When my heart is overwhelmed within me, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Brother Allen, when all hell is broken out in your life, and when you don't know which way to go, and troubles seem to be growing by the acre, and you feel like God's left you all by yourself. There was Jesus. In Matthew chapter 14, the disciples were on the sea in the storm. They're without Jesus. Jesus went up into the mount to pray. And the next thing they're in the night and in the, in the storm of the sea, God comes walking on the water. Brother Allen, they were in some deep trouble, wasn't they? They were in some deep trouble, Brother Scott. I'm talking deep trouble. But their troubles got worse. Brother Allen, Simon Peter said, Lord, would you bid me walk home and see with you? And he said, come. Brother Allen, Simon Peter began to walk on the water. Brother Allen, Simon Peter is my favorite character in all the Bible. I love Simon Peter. He was bold and wasn't cared to hide every once in a while. He had, he had a fire about him, had a spirit about him. That's why I like him. Yes. <clears throat> but he said, Lord, would you bid me walk out on the water to you? And he said, come. Peter began walking out on the water, Brother Allen. He began to look at the winds and seas were boisterous around him. And he was looking around and took his eyes off the prize. Took his eyes off God. Took his eyes off the one that was directed his every step. And you know what happened, Brother Allen? He began to sink. Yep. Yep. He got in trouble. I believe saved people need a saving every once in a while. Yep, no, that's right. You're right about that. You know, I, I thought it was kind of ironic, Brother Allen. 
First Peter chapter number five and verse number seven says, "Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you." You know who pinned down that verse? The man that was sinking down in the sea. The man that was sinking down when he took his eyes off the Lord. And you know what he did? He cried out and said, "Lord, save me! Lord, save me!" Yeah. You know what he said in verse number 31? He said it and immediately. He stretched forth his hand and picked him up. Yeah. Brother Scott, when all hell is broken loose in your life and troubles are coming along and troubles and you don't know what to do uh, and you don't know which way to turn, he'll walk on the stormy waters of your life. Yes. Yeah. He'll walk on them stormy waters of your life when you feel like you can't do nothing and you feel like you're sinking and feel like God's left you all alone. And here he comes walking, running, running over there to your rescue, Brother Steve. And he steps right over there over you and picks you up, sets you back on that solid rock and establishes your goings again. To bring our troubles to the Lord. That's a purpose for the altar. Yes, sir. Bring our troubles to the Lord. What, what is that song that we sing during invitation hour? Bring our, bring our troubles to the Lord and leave it there. Leave it there. That's the key, that's the, that's the key word in that song. Leave it there. Yeah. Too many times, Brother Scott, we get down on our knees and we're like, God, help us. Oh, God, help us. We get right back up home. Oh, what am I going to do about this situation? Uh, right. I know I'm guilty of that. I'll raise my hand to that. I'm guilty of that. We're human. Y'all nod y'all's heads at me. We're all human. We get down on our knees and pray. And we pick our burdens right back up where we left them. And we carry them back with us. You know I'm telling it right. You know I'm telling it right. But the Bible says to... Or the, that song says, take our burdens to the Lord and just leave it there. Yeah. As I was saying about the altar in the Old Testament, Brother Steve, the altar was a place of sacrifice for the lambs and burnt offerings and all the offerings up to God. Right. That, that was remission for sins in the Old Testament. Yep. But you know what they did, Brother Doyle? When they went to the altar and sacrificed, they didn't, they didn't go to the priest and say, hey, when you're done with that, will you give me the shoulders and the hips so I can have them back? They brought that offering to the Lord and they left it there. Yep. 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 They left it there. Brother Steve, they didn't say, hey, I, give me one of them legs off that land. That probably tastes pretty good a little bit later. Brother Scott, they brought it to the Lord and they left it there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How many times, Brother Allen, have we become guilty and become accustomed to coming down to the altar? We think, we think the altar has lost its power. Come on. We come think on. the altar has lost its power. Friend, I've come to tell you the altar has not lost its power. You're right. God still meets at the altar. Yeah. There is still victory in these altars. You may say, preacher, Brother, Brother Danny Jenkins used to say this. I really like it. I'm going to use it to the day I die. He said there's no virtue in these altars, but there's victory. Yeah. There's victory, friend. There's victory in these altars to bring our troubles to the Lord. Yeah. But not only to bring our troubles to the Lord, but to bring our temptations to the Lord. To bring our temptations Amen. to the Lord. Yes, I want to read you a verse over here in Hebrews. To bring our temptations to the Lord. Over here in Hebrews, this is what it says. It says in Hebrews chapter number 4, verse number 15, it says, For we have not a high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Right. Brother Allen, in, in, in 1 John chapter number 2 and verse number 16, we see three things that John brings us. Right. He says the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Over in Genesis, when they sinned in the garden, Eve thought the tree was pleasant to the eye. That was the lust of the eyes. Right. She thought it was good for food. That's the lust of the flesh. Right. She, desired, it, it was a, she thought it was a, des, a tree a desired to make one wise. That's the pride of life. Right. Right. But I believe it's over in Matthew chapter number 4. You may say, preacher, <clears throat> I'm not tempted. I want to stop you right there and say, yes, you are tempted. Yeah. 
Yeah. You're just too prideful to admit that you're tempted. Amen. Amen. Brother Al, we could go all around this building tonight and ask everybody one thing that they struggle with. And I guarantee you, there is one thing in this building that everybody struggles with. My struggles may not be Brother Scott's struggles. Brother Alan, your struggles may not be my struggles. But let me tell you something. If we did go around this building tonight and ask for a showing of hands of all the temptations that go through our mind and the thoughts that go through our mind, there would be a lot of... <gasps> oh, oh, yeah. You're right there. You mean to tell me yeah. that you say your spirit filled and you thought that? Uh, oh, my word. Preach there. You mean to tell me, Brother Steve, that as good as a spirit filled man as you are, you thought that about somebody? Yes, sir. Oh, my word. Yeah, come on. Come on, Avery. You may say, Preacher, well, you just, might, you just may not be spirit filled if you have temptations. Oh, Let's go to Matthew chapter number 4. Come on, come on. Let's go to Matthew chapter number 4. <laughs> Matthew chapter number 4. I believe it's Mark chapter 1 and Luke chapter 4. One of them says that the Lord Jesus was led by the Spirit. Right. One was said that He was driven by the Spirit. Yep. And one said that He was filled with the Holy Ghost. Yep. Let me tell you something, friend. When you get filled with the Holy Ghost, the devil's going to work overtime in your life. Amen. Amen. The devil will work overtime in your life when you get filled with the Holy Ghost. And when you get, when you get down to doing business with God, he's going to work overtime in your life. He don't have a bit of problem with that backslidden Christian. He don't have a bit of problem with them because they just sit on the pew every Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> they sit on that pew every Sunday, don't say a word, don't blink an eye, don't listen to the preaching, don't listen to the singing, don't do anything for God on the weekends. The devil don't have a bit of problem getting them. But it's that one that gets filled with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. It's that one soul that gets full of the Holy Ghost yeah. that the devil's going to work overtime. In Matthew yeah. chapter 4, I believe, I believe I'm right about this, it said the Lord Jesus suffered 40 days and yeah. nights yeah. of temptation. Yeah. 40 days and 40 nights. I would, Brother Steve, I'd go to say the Lord Jesus is pretty spirit filled. Yep, yep, yep. Y'all nod y'all's heads at me. I'm all. I say the Lord Jesus was spirit filled when Satan commanded him to turn the stones into bread. That was the lust of the flesh. When he, when he showed him all the glory of the kingdoms of the nations, that was the lust of the eyes. When he said, cast yourself off the temple so the angels will catch you, that was the pride of life. You see, here in that temptation, in that temptation stage, Brother Allen, it's not what we, it's not the temptations that we have that's sin. Temptation's not sin, friend. We get that mixed up a lot of times. Y'all nod y'all's heads at me. Temptation's not sin. It's how you act upon that temptation that's sin. How, how we act when we are tempted is whether it's sin or not. Well, let me tell you, we have an altar with a purpose, friend. You may say, preacher, I just don't see how you preachers struggle. I believe preachers struggle harder than anybody. I believe pastors struggle more than anybody. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You want to know why? Because they get to lead the flock. Yep. They get to lead the dumb sheep. Yep. You're right. Come on. Not being mean, but sheep are dumb. Yep. I believe it's the pastor's job to lead the sheep. To lead them in how God wants them to go. The devil's going to work overtime. He's going to say, well, that pastor, you, you can just look at this on the internet. It ain't going to hurt you one bit. You can just do this, do that, say this and say that. It won't hurt you. They don't know what you're saying. They don't know what you're looking at. But God does. Amen. It's to bring our temptations to the Lord. But all that to bring our loved ones. I bring our loved ones to the altar yep. with purpose. Amen. To bring our loved ones to the altar. Brother Allen, I say this was as much humble, as humble heart as I can, but I'm thankful that I had a family that prayed. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. 
Y'all that had mamas and daddies that prayed for you, yes, y'all know what I'm talking about. Amen. We had a family that prayed for us. Brother Allen, there's been times that I've been going to preach. I remember one time in specific. A pastor called me. I was at work on a Saturday. He wanted me to come preach in Alabama that Sunday morning. I was like, yeah, because I don't like to turn down nothing. I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll come and I'll do my best. I went home that day and I, I texted mom and I said, hey, will you pack me a bag? I'm going to Alabama to preach. Sort of short notice. And she said, yeah. And as I was walking out the door, Brother Allen, I remember, my dad may not even remember this, but I do. Brother Allen, he said, I'm praying for you tomorrow. Amen. I'm praying for you tomorrow. There's been times that this man sitting on the front row knew I was going to preach and he would tell me that he's praying for me. Brother Allen, there's just something to know that when somebody may look at you like you're stupid when you're preaching, when people may look at you like a calf looking at a new gate, to know that there's somebody praying for you. That lost sinner that could be in your family. Let me tell you something, friend. You ever been backslidden away from God? Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And somebody come after the fact when you got right with God, when you got right with your family, Brother Steve, and that one family member, Brother Steve, say, well, I've been praying for you. Yep. I've been praying for you. Yeah. There's something about knowing somebody's praying yep. for you. Yep. To put your loved ones on the altar. Yep. To put your loved ones on the altar. Luke 22. This is a verse every Christian ought to shout over. I don't know if it's just me, but Luke 22, 32. In verse 31, uh, the Lord told Simon Peter, He said, Behold, Satan had desired that he might have you, that he might sit you as wheat. Yes. But I want you to notice something. I want you all to flip in y'all's Bible so y'all can see this. Luke chapter 22 and verse number 32. Brother, Brother Perry, are you there? Luke chapter 32, or ver, chapter 22 and verse 32. I want you to read that first phrase in that verse. But I have prayed for thee, but thy faith fell not. But I have prayed for thee. Amen. Brother Allen, that's not me telling Simon Peter that I'm praying for him. No. That's the Lord Jesus right. saying, Simon, I prayed for thee. I prayed for you, Simon Peter, that your faith fell not. Yeah. Brother Allen, there's somebody bigger than my daddy and my grandfather that's praying for me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's a God in heaven that's praying for me, friend. When my family may not get a prayer through and ring the prayer bells of heaven, I know somebody that's already in heaven that's praying for me, friend. But not, not only to bring our loved ones to the altar, to bring our trust to the altar. You see, they had an altar, but they didn't know who was backing the altar. You may say, preacher, what are you talking about? I want to use this illustration. I got a $20 bill here. You may say, oh, yeah, preacher, going to give out money. I ain't giving out money. I made a promise to Brother Samuel and I buy my wife dinner with this money. So I'm going to show you this with this money. I'm going to take it home, lay it on my desk. I ain't touching it until I get married. Anybody else got a dollar bill in here? Nope. A lot of us poor in here, right? It's the only $20 bill I got right on me right now. This $20 bill says that this note is a legal tender for all debts, public and private. On the left side, it's signed by the Treasury of the United States of America. And on the right side, it's signed by the Secretary of the Treasury of the United States of America. This thing is backed by the United States of America. It is also backed by the Treasurer, Treasury of the United States of America. One thing about this $20 bill, Brother Scott, is this thing gets worthless and worthless every single day. It gets more and more worthless every single day. You know what this $20 stands for? $26.7 trillion in debt is what the United States of America is in debt right now. That $20 bill right there, don't touch it. I might stab you or tackle you or something. Don't touch the $20 bill. That $20 bill... You know, what it, you know what it illustrates? It illustrates debt. $26.7 trillion in debt by the United States government. But you know one thing that's for sure? 
is that altar is backed by God Himself. God ain't dead. Heaven ain't bankrupt. God ain't in debt. God ain't dead, friend. Heaven had not went bankrupt. This $20 bill may, in, may, may emphasize debt, but God is not in debt. God is not dead. Heaven is not bankrupt, friend. Amen. This altar is something we can trust in, knowing that who we're praying to is the one who's back in the altar. Thank God. The one that's back in the altar is the one that I trust in the most. Yes, sir. 2 Timothy 1, 12 says, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Brother Allen, I do not believe in what I know because that ain't much. But I know in whom I have believed. Yeah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I know in whom I have believed and know that he is able to keep that which is committed unto him that day. Thank God. But lastly tonight, I see suffocating pride, shattered altars, and stiff knees. And I haven't even used my text because I got in such a big way of preaching, I didn't even realize where we were at. But I'm going to go back and bring you up to it. Verse number 10 signified suffocating prides. It said that they would not hearken. They would not hearken to what the Lord had spoken to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. Oh, to hear the voice of God again. Oh, to hearken to the voice of God again. Verse number 16. Shattered altars. The Bible says, He repaired the altar of the Lord. He repaired the altar of the Lord. Verse number 17. Stiff knees. The Bible says, Nevertheless, it's talking about when He repaired the altar of the Lord. It says, Nevertheless, the people did sacrifice steel in the high places yet unto the Lord their God only. You may say, preacher, what is high places? High places and groves indicated more times than not in the Old Testament the sin of idolatry. Right. Yep. Right. That's why high places, it was a religious ritual to go to the highest mountain, to the highest place to sacrifice to whatever God. That's what high places signified. They didn't care if the altar got repaired or not, they just continued in what they were doing. Yep. Brother Allen, these shattered altars make people have stiff knees. Amen. Come on. They make people have stiff knees. Daniel chapter 6 and verse number 10 says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, his windows being opened, and his chamber toward Jerusalem. Listen to this. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. I want to see, I want to pull out a few things real fast and I'll be done, I promise. Three people in the Old Testament that got down on their knees to pray. Solomon. Solomon got down on his knees to pray. You can read it. We're not going to read any of it for sake of time. Second Chronicles chapter 6, verse number 13 and 14. Solomon got down on his knees to pray. To give the temple to God. He was, he was dedicating the temple. But the Bible says that he knelt down on his knees. He knelt down on his knees. Ezra, in Ezra chapter 9, verse 5 and 6, Ezra got down on his knees and prayed and seek the face of God. But Daniel got down on his knees and prayed. You may say, preacher, why are you talking about stiff knees? There ain't nothing in the Bible about knees. The apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter number 3, and verse number 14, he said, For this cause... I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Brother Allen, I read that verse this afternoon. I didn't really understand what the Apostle Paul was saying here. According to the court etiquity uh, in Paul's day, when you went before a throne of a king, when you approached the throne of a king, you had to get down on your knees. You had to get down on your knees and reverence, and reverence the king. And, and respect them. You had to respect them. But we see here that the Bible says that God is our Father, 
The Bible says to come boldly under the throne of grace. Right. We have instant access to God. There's no request that's out of reach. He loves us, friend. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But Scripture teaches us that He should be approached with reverence yep. and awe. Yep. You see, the posture of getting down on our knees is to remind us of His awesome majesty. Amen. Of His awesome majesty of the one that we get to call Father. Amen. You know why we've got stiff knees? Because we don't pray anymore. You're right. You know, Brother Allen, there's a difference in praying and really praying. Yep. Amen. Amen. There's a difference in praying and really praying. Amen. And the Bible says that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It didn't say that, you know, you can pray and some things will some things will come to pass and this and that and the other. Some of this will happen. Some, some, not not that much, but a little bit. It said availeth much. But Alan, my prayer to God is that I'm faithful, I'm fervent. And I'm fearless. You may say, preacher, what do you mean? That I'm faithful to God, my Bible reading, praying, going to church, that I'm faithful to those things, yep. that I'm fervent in my prayers and fervent in my study of my Bible, but that I'm fearless. That God gives me courage and boldness to go up to witness to somebody. I'm going to confess to you tonight, and I don't want, any, I don't want this to ever happen to one of y'all. I was getting gas the other day at work. There's a gas station right across the road from work. I'll use this illustration. I'm done. Brother Allen, I was pumping gas. I got it started and it was pumping, so I sat down back in my car. <clears throat> and I sat down. I was sitting there listening to some music. I was just sitting there. And I, have track, I have some gospel tracks in my glove compartment of my car. Put on gas pumps before I pull off. I got one out. And there, there was a lady and her son that pulled up beside me. And the, and the little boy is probably about 10, 11 year old. He got out and he was pumping the gas for his mother. He was pumping the gas for his mother. Brother Allen, the Holy Spirit of God said, give that track to them. Brother Scott, I cowered down. I was a coward. I pulled that gas nozzle out of that car and I put it on and I stuck that gospel track on that gas tank and I pulled off. I got to the red light and they had circled around the other way and came forward to me at the red light. And Brother Allen, the Holy Spirit of God told me, they're going to hell because of you. Brother Allen, I was broken. I was broken. You know why? Because I got stiff need. I was too weak and too cowardly to try to help somebody. Don't let that happen to yourself. Brother Allen, don't let that happen to you. Brother Stanton, don't let that happen to you. Brother Doyle, don't let that happen to you. Don't cower down. Get bold. Brother Steve, every night since then, I prayed that God would give me boldness. Amen. Even if God would let me preach in front of somebody, I'd rather that than the Holy Spirit of God tell me it's my fault that somebody's going to hell. Brother Allen, we got stiff need. We can't even get down on our knees anymore. Brother Allen, there's going to come a day and time in our life and our family's lives when they're going to need somebody to pray. Amen. That they're going to need somebody to pray, Brother Steve. But our knees have become so stiff. <clears throat> I want everybody to bow their heads, close their eyes. We don't have a piano player tonight, so we're going to give a silent invitation tonight. I don't want any singing, don't want any moving around, anybody open their eyes. <clears throat> but any, would anybody acknowledge the Holy Spirit of God tonight to chunk your pride, get down to one of these altars and do business with God tonight on your behalf. Not to come down here because one of your friends is coming down to pray, but to come down here because you need something from God. With every head bowed, every eye closed, we're going to take a minute. Everybody stand. We're going to take a minute of silence. <clears throat>